O Lord Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit to us to open us this wealth of Scripture so that we would be made wise to the salvation through studying them and reveal yourself to us as our Savior, as the King of nations and the Keeper of your Church. Jesus Christ, let us this knowledge fill us with boldness and courage to hold on to your truth and witness to it, about it in the midst of this darkening world and also give us confidence in your care and your love. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Right, so uh, these, these classes will be recorded. Daniel is, is manning the camera there. And I just now realize that it does mean um, that if you do ask questions, uh, they will be recorded. So I, I don't know how you feel about that kind of thing. Um, we can also do so that uh, if you desire, we can discuss that when we turn off the camera in, during the break, and then we can uh, maybe reserve time at the end for uh, non-recorded questions. But let's talk about that later. Now, at this point, the, the audience in the internet is already bored. When, when is he going to get into business? All right. Um, so, Revelation. We are going to be talking about the book of Revelation today and also 10 Thursdays after this. Thank you very much for coming. Let's make a good class out of this. Uh, I'll share some material in the beginning. Uh, here is a class schedule. And I'll just pass along. Where you will find uh, on the left side column there is a structure of the book of Revelation. Uh, that is just for your own study, sort of helping you to grasp the, the big lines of, of, of this book. And on the right, you will see the class schedule of things we are planning to do with each session and what is the general topic for that session. And I would advise you, when this is a, a lay enrichment course and not something you get credit and tests and papers and things like that, of course I can't require you to do anything, but I would recommend you to read the chapter of Revelation before you come in, it's probably going to be more uh, beneficial for you than when you already have a little bit of that ruminating in your mind. If you don't have time for that, that's completely fine as well, because we will be going through the text itself quite a bit in these classes. Now then, I will also pass lecture notes or lecture material for this first session. My style of teaching is um, so that I generally just talk, talk about the topic and I encourage you to interrupt and ask if there is something you don't understand or which seems confusing to you or want me to repeat something, you know, it can be my broken English also, or, or whatever. Then, if you have Bibles, obviously it's good to have them with you so you can follow. If you don't, I printed for this first session, I have copies of the first chapter of Revelation. If somebody wants that, there. All right, so let's go into the task at hand then. Revelation. Background of the book of Revelation, what do we know about it? Not terribly much. The writer introduces himself as John. And that's it. Uh, early church fathers understood this to be John the son of Zebedee, that is John the Apostle, one of the twelve. Uh, this view is usually questioned or challenged in modern exegesis for various reasons. One of them being the fact that this John never makes any reference to him actually meeting Jesus during his earthly life. But of course, the fact that he doesn't mention that isn't any kind of a proof that he did it. So, but just to let you know that this is uh, sort of a question: uh, When is Revelation written? Probably during the reign of Roman Emperor Domitian, which would be years 81 to 96, when Christians were persecuted in the Roman Empire. I mean, the persecutions of Christians is a topic for next week. We will be talking more about. The, the world in which the first Christians lived. 
and then we will talk about this as well. But probably it's, it's usually located in that, that time period, so towards the end of the first century. In the early church, there were questions about revelation, and many were initially hesitant to accept revelation as part of the Bible, partly because the authorship was not crystal clear, uh, and partly because revelation had been used extensively by a heretical sect of, sect of Montanists. And there happens this, you know, if, if, if crazy group of people start quoting too much, then that casts a shadow over the whole book. And I would say, maybe in some sense, Revelation suffers from that even today, in the sense that nothing gives, uh, you know, a, a springboard for weird, weird interpretations like Revelation. So Christians sometimes can become a bit wary or, 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 or hesitant to take the book of Revelation in their hands and start reading it, because we just know that there's so much weird stuff going around, which is based on Revelation. I think Revelation often is, if you can say it like that, it's, it's often for a young Christian, it's the first book they start reading, and when they mature a little bit, they stop it. That's certainly how it happened with me. I, I think I was in, in confirmation school and I grabbed the book of Revelation and, and Gosh, it was excited with all these trumpets and, uh, and, and cups and beasts and whatever. And then when you start understanding that Christian faith really isn't too much about this sort of thing, but more about uh, repentance and faith, and then you kind of just put the Revelation somewhere and don't, don't go there until 15 years later. I'm glad I did because Revelation has a lot to give. Martin Luther struggled with the book of Revelation, you might have heard of it. Uh, in, when he was translating the Bible in the German language, he also wrote introductions to all the books of the Bible. And first round, Luther didn't understand a thing about Revelation. He said that it's neither prophetic nor apostolic. And, and he kind of thought that this book really shouldn't be in the Bible in the first place. Well, then later on, when Luther revisited these writings and, and wrote new introductions, then he already understood Revelation in a new way, and he wrote very nice words about it. You can sometimes check that if you want. Okay, when it comes to the book of Revelation, we have uh, things we need to sort of settle first, which are, we could say, what kind of glasses are we going to be wearing? when we read the book of Revelation. That dictates a lot of what we get out of it and how do we understand it. And there's roughly four models of interpretation, four ways people have tried to read Revelation. And we will be going through those first and then look into uh, whether the book of Revelation itself gives us, gives us some sort of a, uh, advice or guide into how it's supposed to be read. Now, these four models, first of them would be called preterist interpretation from Latin preter, which means past. We don't have to use these uh, fancy words, but this is kind of kind of established name for it. So the preterist interpretation holds that most or all events mentioned in Revelation have already taken place during the first generation of Christians. So preterist, the name means past, so it views Revelation as a book which describes actually past events for us at this moment past. For the people then, they were current, but that was quite a bit ago. Um, so some of these interpreters see Revelation as a description of the oppressive power of the Roman Empire its perceived corruption and then expected downfall. Others consider the Revelation to be a book about the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem and then collapse of the Jewish nation. Those favoring this kind of interpretation can be divided to radical or full preterists who consider the entirety of, of Revelation to deal just with the events of the first century. That would be one group and the other group would be partial or moderate preterists, which would be way more common, 
who consider most of the events in the Revelation to have already taken place, but hold that some prophecies are still unfulfilled. For example, the second coming of Christ, the lake of fire, the new Jerusalem, and all that kind of things. But uh, they would be much, much more common, I would say. There's very few um, interpreters who would really say that well, everything described in the book has already taken place. Of course, this would require some sort of interpretation on seeing how these, how these events actually took place in the first century. And that might be a little bit hard to do. Then there is a... His, oh, this is a difficult word. You're going to be hearing this many times during this, this lecture series. It's me struggling with a difficult word. Historicist. Historicist. Hmm. Interpretation which sees the revelation as a depiction of the history of the world up until now. And what that means, uh, it traces its back, uh, this, this kind of interpretation goes back to Joachim Fiore from the High Middle Ages, who believed that the revelation described the history of the world up until the year 1260. After which, according to Fiore, a new era would begin. So it, there is also this idea then that it is describing historical events. Most of them have already taken place, but they didn't all take place during the first generation, but rather they kept on taking place throughout the centuries until you come to this age, and usually the interpreter then sees that we are just about on the verge of the end. And, and a new age. From Fiore actually comes the, the idea of three world orders fashioned after the three persons of Trinity with the age of the Holy Spirit marking the new era where people can be in direct contact with God even apart from revealed work. So if you ever heard of this kind of interpretation that there's the age of Father, which is roughly the Old Testament, the age of the Son, which is the age of church after Christ's death and resurrection, and then there is this age of the spirit, usually just around the corner coming, which gives a whole new, whole new uh, way for people to be in touch with God. That's Fiore, that's high middle age mystic Joachim who, who comes up with this idea. Now, some of the reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, also had this kind of a view of the Revelation, seeing it as a book which explained the periods of Christian history. Luther, for example, considered the plagues of the Revelation to be various heresies sent into the world through false teachers. And, and angels who appear in, in Revelation would be uh, good theologians, good church fathers through the history of the church who proclaimed the gospel. I think Luther was wrong. I think, I think, yeah, now this uh, your heart skips a beat for saying that. I have every, um, I have a lot of sympathy for Luther's interpretation. He struggled with Re uh, Revelation, and in the beginning he did, didn't make any kind of sense to him, and he was ready to throw the whole book away, being hot-tempered like he was. And then he figures out a way to read the Re uh, Revelation in a spiritually beneficial way, and then he likes it. I don't think he gets it right, but I think for Luther it was a good thing that he found a way to read it. Luther saw Re Revelation as this sort of a history book of how the, how the world and the church developed after, the, after Christ's uh, resurrection, the first Christian generation. I don't think that's probably very true, but he did his best, and it's, it's not easy to interpret Revelation, and maybe Soon there's somebody else holding a lecture series in, in, in Concordia Lutheran Theological Seminary saying that I got it wrong. <laughs> That's very possible. Uh, the main weaknesses of this kind of historicist interpretation are that the interpretation uh, that connect visions in Revelation with actual historical events are often very vague and debatable. Who is it to say that this angel we see here is, is the church father, Jerome, or that this angel is uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, instead of someone else. And this 
hailstorm is the Aryan heresy. It kind of uses a lot of imagination and you can always challenge these kinds of uh, interpretations. And the second thing, of course, is that in this sort of way, Revelation needs to be reinterpreted if the world doesn't end when you thought it would end. The thing is that if you kind of read the whole Revelation up until your present generation, and you say that this book explains how we got here, well then happens that the world doesn't end, even though you hoped it would. And there's 500 more, more years of Christian history like we have with Luther, then you have to kind of interpret the, what do we do with this extra 500 years, and then the whole interpretation changes. So it's constantly changing there. All right. So, uh, the third option. We have now the idea that uh, Revelation <coughs> basically happened during the first Christian generation. That's the preterist interpretation. Then we have the his historicist interpretation that it's mostly already happened, not during one generation, but during the whole history of the church. Now we go into the futurist or Kiliast interpretation, which looks at the Revelation as a book that for the most part is speaking of things still in the future. So now we change it completely. Now we're not talking about past things, but future things. In this futurist view, chapters 4 to 22 uh, oh, sorry, not 4 to 22, but 4 to 19, would describe a specific period of history, usually interpreted to be seven years in length, that immediately precedes Christ's second coming. So the first three chapters would still be letters to the, uh, to the congregations, but then what John begins to see, he sees a specific period of time in the history of the world, which is still in front of us. We haven't yet got there. And all these seals and trumpets and beasts, they are still on their way. And I guess the idea then is that when it starts to happen, all true Christians will realize that now we are living in the uh, reality of Revelation. Futurist views were popular in the early church until the mainline interpretations shifted towards allegorical or idealist interpretation, which we will look at very soon. This, this favor uh, or, or changing of, of, of interpretation was mainly by characters such as Origen and Church Father Augustine, who favored a new way of reading interpretation, uh, Revelation. But it's, it's good to know that early Christian generations tended to read Revelation as a book which tells of events in the future, coming just around the corner. Now, in the history of interpretation, then, futurist <coughs> reading was sort of, it wasn't so popular anymore for the longest time. And it really became popular again with a character named John Nelson Darby, living mm -hmm. in, in 19th century in England, who proposed what is then known as dispensational view dividing the history into seven eras or dispensations. So there would be Paradise, Noah and his covenant, Abraham, Israel and the law of Moses, Gentiles, which is the church, and then the Spirit's time, which is still to come, and finally the millennium. Uh, this was uh, Darby's idea. And then Darby was suggesting that the revelation was actually describing only the last two dispensations. Not talking about the church, but talking about the coming age of spirit, very much like the Joachim Fiore we already heard about, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and then the millennium that follows from that. Now Darby's interpretation was not widely known until comes Schofield's reference Bible, one of the most in, uh, you could say, uh, one of the theological books with biggest impact in North American, uh, you know, mainline Christianity. Schofield's Reference Bible is a study Bible. You know how study Bibles are. They, they have the text and then a lot of footnotes. And, and Schofield's study Bible comes out in 1909 and becomes very, very popular. And Schofield's study Bible actually adopts Darby's 
interpretation of what revelation is and this whole dispensationalist thinking. And, and then, with very popular study Bible, it spreads through North American Christianity and becomes, for many churches, uh, you could say it becomes the mainline interpretation of revelation. For uh, Pentecostal or charismatic churches, that's usually the way they are reading revelation. And then the fourth uh, model of interpretation would be maybe called idealist, which looks at revelation as a book that is not even meant to describe concrete historical events or circumstances, but rather teaches timeless truths, timeless spiritual realities. According to this view, Revelation is a story of a constant battle between good and evil, the struggles of the church at the hands of the persecuting world, and the ultimate triumph of Christ over Satan. And none of these really have to do with any particular events in the history, either in the past or in the future, but these are something which takes place all the time, everywhere. The ambiguity of this interpretation is both its weakness and its strength. It makes the revelation quickly and directly applicable to every context in a spiritually meaningful manner. So any person in any situation can read revelation and find some sort of comfort there and somehow relate it to their own life. On the other hand, this kind of interpretation makes it very hard to find certainty about what particular parts of the revelation actually are talking about. It's, it becomes more like a devotional writing that gives you nice pious ideas, but it's, it's hard to nail it down, what does it actually mean. And this, like mentioned, was, was uh, used by Origen and also Church Father Augustine with his view of revelation as a symbolic depiction of the conflict between God and the devil, the city of God and the city of Satan. All right, so now we have there four different views, very different views actually, how revelation can be read. And now do we need to choose one of those? <laughs> you might already you know, be, be making like a question marks next to the things you don't like and, and big exclamation marks and underlining things which you think are spot on. And I don't dare to ask which, which uh, of you want to choose which. I think none of these, purely as they are, uh, are good. All of these have good size in them. Uh, uh, and, and none of these is, is completely what I would say is the best way to read Revelation. But before we go into that judgment, let's take a few looks into Revelation itself and what kind of keys the Revelation offers to us. First, the topic of Revelation. The name of the book itself suggests that something is being revealed. So how does it begin? The opening verse, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. The common translation we have, which says of Jesus Christ, is more accurate than sometimes found revelation from. It is of, not from. Literally it means it's the Jesus Christ's apocalypse. Now what is an apocalypse? In English language, apocalypse well, you, you tell me, what is apocalypse? What's the connotation of apocalypse? What does it sound like? It's destruction. usually something... Huh? Destruction. Destruction, exactly. Fire and, and, and brimstone and explosions and lots of people dying, yes, things like that. And you know, even <clears throat> you could say that there's religious sense of apocalypse which give, uh, brings the idea of, of complete destruction or even you can use it in a secular sense of saying that there's, I, I guess in, in literature you could say there's like apocalypse would be like a, a destruction of the world as we know it. 
so there's a nuclear war and, and the humanity needs to go into bunkers and then they emerge again in the post-apocalyptic world. But still the world is there. But nonetheless means complete destruction of the world as we know it. Now, the Greek word simply means to remove the covering. Apocalypse in the original sense of the word has nothing to do with fire and explosions. Apocalypse means to take off the covering, or to take off the veil, you could say. That is, to reveal something which was previously hidden. We call it Apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which characterizes, or I would say, should guide our understanding of the book from this very beginning. The Revelation is not a book about the end of the world. It's not a book about Satan. It's not a book about Antichrist. It is a book about Jesus. Its purpose is to reveal Jesus Christ to the reader. Here, too, we can with good reason follow Martin Luther's rule of biblical interpretation. So even though I think he didn't quite get it right with Revelation, I think he generally got it right with how to read Bible. Rule of biblical interpretation. The Bible drives Christ. Treiben. Like push Christ. Or, or, or bring him. So, Bible's function is to bring Christ to the reader. And if it does not, then you are probably not reading it the way it's supposed to be read. So it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's revealing Jesus to us. That's the point of revelation. Time focus in revelation. I would say now. It's to show to his servants the things that must soon take place in the first verse. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ to show his servants the things that must soon take place. This implies certain urgency in the message of revelation. This prophecy is not understood to speak of things far, far away in the ages yet to come, but rather of things in the imminent future, just uh, in your grasp. Also good to note, at the very end of Revelations, in, in chapter 22, verse 10, uh, John is given an instruction. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. And this contrasts then with Daniel, where in Daniel 12.4, the ending of, of Daniel says, Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. The words are shut up and sealed until the end of, all the time of the end. So with Daniel you have uh, God commanding Daniel to seal the book because it's not yet time. And there will be uh, generations and in, uh, knowledge will increase and then comes the end. But now the book will remain closed. And then, uh, in, in Revelation 22, it's a clear contrast to Daniel. Do not seal. So, the Revelation understands that what we have here, what we are now reading, is current. It's happening now. It's, it's reality where we are now. We don't have to wait for ages with people coming to and fro, but it's actually now current. So it was meant to be understandable, understandable book already for the first generation that received Revelation. Uh, context for Revelation, church and liturgy. The first chapter, 10th verse, tells uh, when the vision is given to John, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Is Sunday somehow significant for John. Usually this kind of information is not given unless it has some significance. Paul never says that this letter was written on that and that weekday. No. It's said 
only that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, which means Sunday, but we, John doesn't explain more what, what it means. But we are left guessing here, and they can't really say definite things, but it does tickle your imagination. Perhaps John even received a vision in or during church service, that he was uh, hearing the word being proclaimed, and then things started happening. The liturgical setting of the Revelation is revealed in first chapter, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. The one who reads aloud and those who hear. So it's addressing a Christian assembly, where one is reading the words of prophecy and the others are listening. The context is church. It's actually a letter, Revelation. It's a letter directed to the seven churches, we find in chapters 2 to 3. Even though the letters directly addressing these churches take only two chapters of the whole book, and you very easily jump over them and skip them and, and rush into more spectacular visions, they actually form the foundation of the whole revelation. What John writes, he writes to Christ's servants in those churches, for their benefit. So actually the, the chapters from 1 to 3 and then 22 where he or, or returns to that theme, they make the foundation of the revelation. This is a letter to Christian congregations revealing Christ to them. So summary, the book of Revelation was written for those seven real and concrete churches in a manner that they could then and there understand and apply. First of all, revealing to them their Lord Jesus Christ. However, Revelation has still a larger task, as is shown at the end on the, in the chapter 22, where John speaks to anyone who might hear these words and, and twist them. He gives this warning to anyone who might do so. So there is a little hint of universality already there, that this message will get to a larger audience than just these seven churches. And therefore, vice versa, anyone who hears them and faithfully receives these words also receives the blessings promised in this book. Then I'll share a few other points about uh, how to interpret Revelation and then we'll draw together some sort of conclusions about um, what kind of a book this is and how do we uh, understand it. Then we can have a little pause and then go into the actual first chapter and go through what's in there. Revelation is the culmination of biblical prophecies concerning God's power and rule and the final things. It does not do this task alone, but continues, deepens, and in many ways explains what is already revealed. And one reason Revelation is very difficult for us is that we are not versed enough in the Old Testament uh, similar kind of books, especially Ezekiel and uh, Daniel and Zechariah. And to know these books well helps in understanding Revelation. It is also good to be aware that the Jews had apocalyptic writings uh, which, were, which, while never considered part of God's holy word, are still interesting documents for understanding what kind of tradition of apocalypse forms the context for Revelation. So there were also other kinds of writings which we don't even have in the Bible, and I don't know if any of us needs to actually go and study them. They are not dangerous, but they are a little bit odd. And sometimes I would say Enoch and Apocalypse of Abraham, but it's good to know that there were other ap apocalyptic writings among Jews going around, and Revelation kind of exists in that kind of context. A ruling theme in the Old Testament apocalyptic writings is not merely acquiring hidden knowledge about future things, but rather receiving visions of God's power and might. Already in Ezekiel, oh sorry, Exodus 24, the elders of Israel see God in his majesty. 
Then Isaiah 6, that, uh, where Isaiah sees Lord Sabaoth in his temple. And Daniel 7, uh, Ezekiel 1, uh, all repeat the same kind of vision. The great message of Old Testament apocalyptic literature is the Lord reigns. Book of Revelation repeats this message, bringing in a deeper understanding of the Lamb who, being God himself, reigns with the Father. So there's a Christological uh, side to this vision of God's grandeur. But it really is, if you, if you think about the main thrust of of this apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament. It's not so... We easily get captured in the idea that they receive secret messages about the future. But what they actually do receive, which is more uh, important to them, is knowledge about the reality as it is now. That they have visions of God's almighty power. They see God in His majesty on His throne, governing the, all the events of the world. And that is not really a, a vision of the future or a past, but it's a vision of something which is constantly true. And that is often the main message any of these books give. Now when we say that it's a vision, Revelation is a vision, or a description actually, of the vision John received. And what is a, what is a vision? Visions are, like sometimes said, Vision is a parable, make a parable in a visual form. So it's a parable which is put in the form of images. They are not one-to-one -one re recordings of events as they will take place in the future. Rather, they are visual prophecies that preach through images. An example. To Consider, for example, uh, could be Ezekiel 37 and the Valley of the Dry Bones. Uh, the prophet sees this vast valley filled with bones, and then uh, they, they 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 start getting together, and the sinews and muscles grow there, and the skin comes, and then they, they finally the the breath of the Lord comes, and they live. Now we kind of know what Ezekiel or his vision is talking about, he's talking about the restoration of Israel. That the nation which was scattered and slain, basically, will be restored, which takes place um, in, in when they are released from Babel, but even more so, of course, in Christ, who brings life to, to dead, uh, spiritually dead people. Well, so the Valley of Dry Bones is a vision which describes an event which never happened in the way Ezekiel saw it. And with this I mean, oh, of course it's possible, but we really don't know of any instance where there would have really been a valley full of dry bones which would have come to life. What Ezekiel has is a vision where God gives him something to see, and through that vision he is teaching a thing. And the thing is that your nation will be restored, and I will in life, where now is only death. And the fact that there probably never was an actual valley filled with actual skeletons, which actually rose one day and started walking, doesn't make Ezekiel's vision any less important. We just understand that this is the nature of the vision. And that's how Revelation also works. Revelation is filled with visions. It's not like video footage of the end of the world. This is sometimes, people describe these events like um, there's these locusts coming and it, it, they, are, uh, they have metal, metal armor and, and whatever faces and everything and then somebody says that, that John is seeing uh, attack helicopters in this vision. And that because he's unable to understand what a helicopter is, he's calling them locusts, but actually he might be seeing real helicopters. And this kind of misses the whole point, that, that they, this kind of interpretation thinks that John is seeing some sort of video footage about the final Armageddon battle or whatever. But that's not the case. John really sees locusts. But will there actually be locusts flying in the, in the world 
with metal casings who are doing this stuff? Not necessarily. I mean, they might be, but probably not. It might be that th this is a vision which describes something which will happen to the church and, and, and God's creation. And in that vision, it takes the form of a locust with a metal armor or, or a face or something like that. But what actually takes place in reality might look very different. Just like in Ezekiel's vision, uh, it, it, it did happen, but it happened visually in a very different way. Okay, uh, final point, Revelation is not a linear book. To be remembered, uh, if you read it like uh, a story which has a beginning and everything follows nice and tidy from the previous event, it doesn't make sense. And this is where a lot of frustration comes. Revelation jumps back and forth. Re the world ends two or three times before you come before you come to the final judgment. Uh, and, and and you have this series of, of seals are being broken and, and fire and brimstone comes and the and the kings of the earth hide in the mountains and say, you know, now is the horrible day of of Lamb's wrath has come upon us. And what is that? That's that's final judgment. <clears throat> that's the final judgment scene. But then the revelation doesn't end. It it's kinda like you hear somebody turn on the switch and whoosh, you're back in the beginning. You see another vision, and then comes uh, trumpets, and again there's hail and, and, and brimstone and, and flood and pestilence, and then again the world seems to be ending, and then again we go into another vision. So Revelation doesn't follow this sort of neat sequence, and if you try to make it work, it just doesn't. You, you, you lose your hair like I do, and, and, and it just doesn't fit. Or you really have to do some acrobatics in trying to make everything work. Only in the chapters, I would say, 17 to 22, uh, Revelation really gets into eschatological or this sort of end time fulfillment where comes the destruction of Babel and then the, the Satan is being cast down and then comes Christ returns as the white rider and slays the devil final judgment and the uh, lake of fire and New Jerusalem. It's only then that Revelation really gets into this full-blown, this is what happens at the end of the world kind of thing. Everything before that is repeating uh, uh, this kind of preparation. And even in those final chapters, um, uh, the contact or connection to present day is kept strong. Before that, uh, we could say that as revel most of the revelation before you come to the final uh, climax, most of the revelation just describes what is true now from three viewpoints, from God's church on earth struggling under the, the persecution, God's reign in heaven, uh, which is absolute and uncontested, and then the hatred and the unbelief of the fallen world and the, and the devil. So these are the three stages or, or viewpoints, I could say, like the church, the, the reign in heaven, and, and the unbelieving world. And most of the revelation takes looks or, or viewpoints from these uh, and describes, I would say, what is true now in the forms of visions? So, my understanding of how we should read Revelation, and you're not forced to follow this, but this is pretty much probably how this lecture series is going to go, but you never know actually. It might be that I change my mind when we're halfway through. <laughs> this is how I come to understand Revelation, but you should never consider yourself too learned to, to be ready to change. I understand that the book of Revelation is a revelation of timeless spiritual truths which are applied and fulfilled in concrete historical events time and time again, preparing the church for the final fulfillment in the visible return of Jesus Christ. 
I think that moderate preterist view, uh, which says that everything happened already back then, it is correct in the sense that revelation speaks of things which were understandable for the first generation that preceded. It really is a book which was not meant to be sealed. So I, I consider that to be one hermeneutical key, as they say, that the people who first received revelation were able to understand what it means and to put it into use right away. So in that sense, there's, I don't think that revelation is a book which mostly deals with things the first reader would have no idea or no way of applying. The realities they experienced were explained in Revelation. However, this does not mean that the prophecy of the Revelation was exhausted during the first generation. The question to be answered is, can one prophecy be fulfilled more than once? For example, exegetes are quite certain that the beast in Revelation 13, the number of 666, we all know that, the beast has something to do with Emperor Nero. I think it's a pretty, pretty strong case. If we accept this, does it mean, therefore, that Revelation 13 has already happened and we can basically just strike it out of, out of our Bibles? That so it wouldn't have any other meaning other than historical curiosity to the reader today. The prophecies of this nature can be applied to concrete events in history and still claim that they are not exhausted by such fulfillments. As another example, Daniel in the Old Testament speaks of the abomination in the temple and the discontinuation of the daily sacrifice. And this quite probably was fulfilled when Antiochus IV Epiphanes in 214 to 164 before Christ conquered and desecrated Jerusalem temple. But still Jesus in Matthew 24 speaks of this abomination Daniel mentions as a thing which is still to come. So does this mean that Antiochus Epiphanes uh, was the wrong answer? Or, or is Jesus talking about the destruction of the temple which is to come? Or some other event? Some event which is even much, much later than the destruction of the Jewish temple that follows only at the very end of the world. I think the best answer would be all of these. When Daniel prophesied, it did become fulfilled in Antioch's Epiphanes, but it didn't finish the prophecy. When Jesus prophesied, very probably pointing also to the destruction of the temple, again it was fulfilled, but it was not finished. And it still remains to wait for the final uh, abomination, which then, one time, will be the last one, and then uh, immediately before our Lord's return. So prophecy doesn't exhaust itself, but rather gains momentum with each such event as it continues to point to the last and ultimate fulfillment. Historicist interpretation, you know, seeing the world history and the centuries as described in the Revelation, is um, correct in the sense that there are historical connections with his, uh, Revelation and the history of the world, but they are not limited in the, in the first generation. However, again, pointing to the fact that things don't need to happen uh, only once. So it might be that the whole revelation holds true for every generation and not that our, our generation gets to live the, the chapter 8 and our children get to chapter 9 or, or things like that. Idealist interpretation where revelation is seen as, as a, a timeless spiritual truth is correct in seeing the main message of the revelation focusing on spiritual truths. This interpretation rightly understands that the revelation was not only meaningful to the first generation of recipients, but continues to be so for every Christian reader. However, this meaningfulness does not exclude real connections with actual history. Actually, these eternal spiritual truths uh, get their full meaning because they are connected to real history. 
and to actual events in our lives and in the lives uh, in the events of this world. They are not floating in some sort of abstract reality of ideas and opinions, but they do become flesh in some sense in, in actual historical events all the time. And the futurist interpretation which sees Revelation as something which points to future is correct in the sense that the book of Revelation has a viewpoint towards the things still yet to come. While it does explain the present, it also makes a promise of the future. And especially chapters 17 to 22 describe events which in some sense might already be a reality, you know, we already celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in the communion and we already together with the, with the spirit and the, and the groom, uh, bride group say come, but still we wait for things to fulfill their few, full disclosure. So that's pretty much how I read Revelation and how I, I understand it. It's that it's, it was and it continues to be relevant to every generation, not as, a, a, as just ambiguous spiritual truth, but as actually speaking about real events where we live. But not in the sense that, you know, one event is always only one thing in the Revelation, but rather they keep repeating themselves again and again. So there will be beast, and maybe Nero was a beast, and maybe Diocletus was a beast, and maybe Napoleon was a beast, like, like some people uh, uh, interpreted in, in the early 19th century. And maybe Hitler was a beast, or maybe Stalin was a beast, or maybe they were both beasts. And, and it just, every generation has its beast. Every generation has its false prophet. Every generation has to suffer similar kind of things. And every generation gets the same conflict. And it doesn't mean that we are wrong if we say that this event is explained in the Revelation. It is. But we are wrong if we think that once explaining it means that Revelation is now void from that event. All right. Now, we, I've been talking for an hour. If you want to ask a question concerning this kind of interpretation models or, or just comment on something, that would be good. Otherwise, I think we'll take a little break and then continue after that. All right, let's uh, call a seven minute break. So five past eight, we'll be back. Okay, so welcome to the second part. Of our, if we just wipe out the first part, then this is the first part. <laughs> and you have no idea why we're interpreting this one the way we are. Okay, so if you have Bibles, please take the first chapter. Now we will go through the text itself and I'll make comments about it. Uh, I can read the, the first chapter first and then let's go through it in, in, in more detail. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's take a stop here uh, and, and speak a little bit about that before we go forward. He made this revelation, we already talked about the revelation of Jesus Christ, how that characterizes the whole book. 
he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. What angel? In Revelation, and in Revelation, angels often appear to lead John from one vision to another and explaining to him what takes place and how, how what it means. So what is this angel? He may be a created spirit of God, you know, the, the angels, what we usually speak of as angels, serving him by serving God by guiding John through the visions. But it might also be that the, the seven angels we encounter later in the book are the same as the seven spirits that stand in front of God's throne and are depicting the Holy Spirit himself. So this is maybe a question where we don't have full certainty, but it's just interesting to think about what is this angel. And we soon find that angels mean sometimes not just uh, the winged um, characters we see in St. Michael's Day, but might be other things. So it might be that this is even depicting Holy Spirit himself, that the angel or the messenger uh, from God is the Spirit. Now this is just something to think about. The words of this prophecy in the third word, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. John understands himself to be the same chain of messengers as all the prophets of old. There are two functions, at least, to prophecy. It reveals the truth about reality, as it is and is about to be. And secondly, confronts the hearer, calling them to repentance and faith. So firstly, uh, prophecy reveals the truth of the world, not only as it will be, but also as it is already now. So prophecy is misunderstood if it is limited to deal only with things still lying in the future. The main message of any prophecy can be summarized by saying, God is in control of things, even if you can't see it. There will be a day of reckoning, and repent, turn away from evil, and put your trust in God's grace, and you will be saved. This is basically the message of every prophet. God rules, there will be judgment on its way. Repent now that there is time and put your faith in God. The prophets of ancient Israel prophesied about the future events, especially dealing with, with the nation of Israel, but always with the intention that their hearers would turn to God now. When the prophet was preaching, then was the time to turn. The focus of prophecy is always in the present situation and how the hearers ought to turn to God in true repentance. And that is also how revelation is to be understood. Now, then 4 to 6. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. This name of God is repeated throughout the Revelation, in many cases, uh, with the emphasis on God's omnipotent power and the righteousness of His judgment. This greeting here forms a Trinitarian formula, meaning it's speaking of Trinity, continuing with the seven spirits who are clearly depicting Holy Spirit. So it is from, God, from Him who is and was and is to come, that's God the Father, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, that's the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, uh, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Seven is a number that is repeated in the Bible many, many, many times, and especially in Revelation, time and time again. In Jewish thinking, uh, numbers often are not just numbers, but numbers carry uh, a symbolical meaning. And seven was the number of divine perfection. So oftentimes numbers don't merely describe um, amounts, but characterize the things they are describing. 
to speak of the Holy Spirit as seven spirits does not mean uh, that we would have six additional persons of God here, you know, there's being, instead of one Holy Spirit, we have suddenly, oops, seven Holy Spirits, and then we have holy ninety. No, it means, seven spirits means that God the Holy Spirit is characterized by a divine fullness and perfection. He is not a spirit, he is the spirit. So that's what the seven spirits means. Similar understanding explains also the seven churches in Asia, which comes in verse 4. Asia being a province. Huh. What? First time in my seminary career I actually use this map for anything. I always teach in this class. Yes, it's here. That's Asia. Yeah, Sardis and Smyrna and Pergamon and everything. There they are. So, um, oh, wow, I just stopped that because of that. Uh, <clears throat> Seven churches in Asia mean, sure enough, it means these real, actual churches struggling with their particular problems, but the letters are not meant just for them. Rather, seven churches, uh, here again, the seven points to completeness. What is written later, both in terms of warnings as well as promises, is addressing the entirety of God's church, not just random seven local congregations. There were lots more in Asia, even in that time. Way more congregations than seven. Christ is the ruler of kings on earth. That's good to hear, especially if you live as a persecuted minority. It's comforting to know. But it's also saying that he has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. So this ties together the almighty power of Christ and the glory he assigns to his own church. Christ is the ruler over all kings, even though it does not visibly appear so, especially for the persecuted church. But he rules and he shares and extends this glory by making his church into a kingdom where his people serve as priests to God. And now you remember what's the other New Testament passage which sounds very much like this. It's 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession. Which shows how especially the Gentile believers uh, or which speaks especially to Gentile believers of the inclusion, inclusion in the God's holy people and priesthood in Jesus they experience. That the Gentiles who previously were not a nation and were unfil unclean are now holy royal priesthood, a nation. The nature of this priesthood is then more fully revealed in Revelation 4 and 5, when John is taken into heavenly temple to observe the continual worship there. As priests of God, Christians already now partake in that service. So, uh, the first chapter is not just niceties and fluff. It, it really does create this sort of links to the later parts of Revelation. So, for example, here it's established. The recipients of the letter are priests. And let you, John lets it sit there and you go forward a couple of chapters and then you come to heavenly worship and then you figure out, oh, this is what is storing for priests. God's priests get to do this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Refers to Daniel 7.13, where one in the likeness of the Son of Man appears to come in the clouds, which is this Daniel's vision of the the, the ancient of days. Also corresponds with the words of the angel following Christ's ascension. Jesus was carried away by a cloud. And then says, This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, 
even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Now, what is what is the reference there? Zechariah. Zechariah 12, where they look on me, on whom, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn. And in Zechariah 12, this is a promise of spiritual restoration, renewal. That even though they will wail, the Jerusalem will be weeping. It's actually part of the, the promise that a, a fountain of forgiveness will be uh, open in Jerusalem. So it's, it's talking about forgiveness and grace coming through this piercing. It's actually... Uh, Pretty interesting how Zechariah explains it. Uh, uh, they look on me whom they have pierced. And who is this me? Well, it's God. God is speaking through Zechariah, saying they look into me whom they have pierced. So Zechariah is also testifying about the true divinity of Christ, that he who was pierced is the me who speaks to Zechariah. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Two more ways. We already heard uh, the one who was and is and is to come. Now we see uh, two more ways how God is described in Revelation. Alpha and the Omega and the Almighty. The first and the last is especially used by Isaiah who uses this as a description of God's omnipotence again, the first and the last. This is a subtle but interesting way how Revelation again testifies about the true divinity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is true God. If you go through Revelation and you just check how God and Jesus speak of themselves, uh, in verse 1, 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Lord God. Okay, so it's God. Then you go into 117. It's Jesus who says, I am the first and the last. Alpha and Omega. First and the last letter of the alphabet. And then Jesus says, I am the first and the last. Then you jump 20 chapters forward. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the voice from the throne. And then Jesus says at the 22nd chapter, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What this means is not shocking to us Christians, but you can use this sometimes to tease Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe. Jesus and God, who is obviously and clearly named as God, sitting on the throne are talking about themselves with exact same words. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And it's not a coincidence. It's not, it's not that John ran out of cool things to say and he decided to repeat himself. No, he's making a point. He's making a point here about the full divinity of Jesus Christ. All right. Um, John reveals about himself. Oh, let's go into reading the, the, the rest of the first chapter then. From 9 onwards. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. We assume that John was exiled to Patmos because he was preaching and he got into trouble with authorities it's very possible that this is what happened. But it's possible to think also that he was there voluntarily, serving God by preaching the word of God and giving the testimony of Jesus to those living on Patmos. What John actually says is simply that he was on the Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that he's there because he got into trouble preaching. He's simply saying, word of God was the reason I was in Patmos. And maybe he went there to preach. We don't know. Just nice to think about it. Uh, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. 
an expression borrowed from Ezekiel, who moves from one vision to another in the Spirit or led by the Spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean that John or Ezekiel was in some kind of ecstatic trance, but rather that he was addressed by the Spirit, not by human experience or human rationalities. Um, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write that you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamon and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white like white wool like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So Jesus described standing in the middle of the lampstand. Very soon, in the, in the verse 20, we hear that these lampstands represent the seven churches this revelation is going to be sent to. Jesus is standing in the middle of the churches. He is not speaking from high heavenly pedestal up there, observing from great distance how his church on earth is doing. Rather, he is in the middle, he's smack in the middle of the lampstands, true to his promise, I will be with you all the days until the end of the earth, end of the ages. A description of Jesus, hairs white, uh, eyes like flame of fire, long robe, golden sash around his chest, these draw again from many Old Testament sources. Uh, Daniel's vision of the last judgment, one like a son of man, also Ezekiel seeing the throne where one like with a human appearance is sitting. Uh, Daniel writes of a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufas around his waist. White robes, uh, golden belt. His body was like burial, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his voice like the sound of a multitude. Very much like this description of Jesus. There's one thing which is different. Um, Revelation speaks of Jesus' hair white as wool, which is borrowing from Daniel 7, 9, where it's also this character with hair, hair white as wool, but in that case it's the Ancient of Days, the God in his full glory, the Father in majesty. So that's again maybe a tiny highly uh, indication how Christ is depicted in the same manner as God. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Conforms to 2 Thessalonians, where the lawless one, the Antichrist, Thessalonians speaks about, will be killed with the breath of Christ's mouth. And also to Hebrews 4.12, which speaks of God's word as living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So what happens to John when he sees this Christ? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Understandable human reaction. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. John is experiencing the same as Daniel in Daniel 10. The vision takes all strength out of him, and he falls down on his face with terror and awe. John is as though dead, and in that moment he is comforted by Jesus who says, I am the living. John is as good as dead, but he meets Jesus, who is the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. 
To possess the keys of death means to have control over it, to open and to close. The gospel of fear not is not an empty promise or baseless comfort. There is a foundation to these words in the fact that Jesus died, but he came back to life and now rules over the power of death. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. As noted already earlier briefly, angel in scripture is not always meaning God's spirit servant, the Saint Michael and all the angels group. Malachi speaks of priests as angels. Haggai himself, prophet Haggai, is called Malak of the Lord, which means angel in normal translation. In Revelations 1.20, seven stars, which are seven angels, and in the following chapters, angels of these congregations are not spirit beings. They are not the guys with wings and harps. Uh, wings and harps. Uh, there's really not much point for Jesus to write uh, a letter to his angels and ask John to send it to them. Now is uh, no, he can talk to his angels <clears throat> very easily without John. Uh, what is happening here is Jesus is talking of the shepherds, the pastors of these congregations, as angels. Angels of the Lord are the messengers of the Lord. That's what the word angelos in Greek means. It means a messenger. True enough, it's mostly used uh, of these spirit beings, but the word itself simply means a messenger. So messenger of the Lord can also, and it has been used, for example, John the Baptist was angel of the Lord. He said, I will send my angel before to make the road clear. And that was John, and John was made of flesh and blood. So these seven angels are the pastors in these congregations. And it's a beautiful image for every pastor to realize that they are held in the right hand. Jesus, that he has in his hand his servants, holding on to them. And then comes the depiction of the churches as golden lampstands, which points to the lamps made of solid gold in the Holy of, holy of Jerusalem Temple, uh, Exodus 25. The menorah with its seven flames was a prefigure of Christ, who is the light of the world. Again, seven pointing to perfect and full divine light. The churches are depicted as seven golden lampstands, speaking of them as noble instruments of God's work, suitable for kingly priests. But even more than that, the church is the body of Christ and the dwelling place of the seven torches in front of God's throne, His Holy Spirit. So the pastors receive comfort the church receives uh, glorification. It is indeed the holy lampstands uh, among which Jesus stands. And so we come to the uh, connection point between the first chapter and then what comes in the next two chapters, which will be the topic of our uh, lecture next week. Uh, now we've set the stage, looked into the history of uh, Old Testament prophecies and apocalypses, seen how John already, in the first chapter of the book, you know, there rolls out uh, connections to the Old Testament, the divinity of Christ, uh, and, the, and the grand message that is to come. And now then, next time, we will look into the, uh, the actual letters uh, to these congregations, and what, what do they reveal about the time and place where the Christians lived. Now, if you have some questions or comments, we can take some. Uh, speaking of possible, I'm going to take this off on topic because it's feeding my words back to me slightly after I'm saying them. Uh, uh, speaking of a possible liturgical connection, uh, could we connect possibly the fact that Ezekiel was in the spirit when he received his vision and John was in the spirit 
when he received his vision with the fact that Ezekiel was a priest and sometimes he received his visions while he was serving as a priest. Oh, that's a very good point. I didn't come to think of that, but yeah, that's right. That's right. And he said of Isaiah as well, that Isaiah's vision of the Lord being in his temple might... I think there's a little bit of, of Im Im imagination in these interpretations, but that's not always the bad thing. You can think of Isaiah 6 perhaps taking place in the temple, where he sees the same pillars as others, but his vision is feel like a, you would imagine like a negative, no, not negative, like a film put on top of another film, so that suddenly he sees some things the others don't see, but he still sees also the things the others see. So the others only see the temple, but he sees the temple filled with the glory of the Lord. Uh, yeah, that's very possible. I was actually playing with the idea, and this is really, this is just my, my what if kind of a thought, that it might be, and really honestly, this is just just my my imagination. But I was just thinking how it could be possible that John receives the vision in the service, in the service uh, in Patmos on the on the. Lord's Day, when and then when he comes to the reading, normally you know epistles were read in the service, comes to Bible readings, and that's when he receives the the letters he is supposed to write to the seven congregations, and then it's after that he hears a door being opened, and uh, and, and and saying, "Come up here," and we know that usually in the old Christian house churches, they very often they had they had like two rooms next to each other with with one room being used for catechesis and scripture reading and after that the unbaptized would, would go home and then the baptized would move into the other room through the door to have the Lord's Supper and in my vision I was thinking that John is there and then he hears the door being opened and he sees where everybody else is going and he follows there and he's bombarded with these new visions and the revelation then ends with them uh, in the chapter 22 with this invitation of come come and and he hears the voice come from the altar and then he hears Maranatha which is part of the ancient Christian uh, communion liturgy uh, so <laughs> I'm just playing with the idea that this whole book might have been given to John during one divine service, which probably blew his mind, but it may, may not be that, but I kind of like the idea, so I'm going to keep on thinking about that. Any other questions? I don't think that it was, a, uh, it was an accident or a choice from John to be lonely on that island of Patmos. I think that was directed by God because I, when I read Holy Scripture the first time, and I said, wow, the emperor killed everybody. Anybody that spoke the word of God and preached the word of God. Mm. So he put him on this island and to punish him. But God must have put this into the emperor's mind to take him away so he can't do any damage on the mainland. Yeah, and then he does that. And then yeah. he has the private audience with his word. Mm -hmm. And what blew me away, when I looked at the life of John, he was the love of us. Mm. For three years he was together with the Lord. He knew him intimately. He cried with him, he slept with him, he eats, sleeps, everything. Preaches, suffers, he witnessed everything. He was so close, and when he saw the risen Lord and dared to turn around, and he fell on his face like that. And I said to the person, I said, Ryan, what is your relationship with Jesus? When John fell dead on his face. That's true. That speak, speaks of the real fear of God. Wow. Mm. Why? Why did he fear like this? He listened to him for three years. He listened to Jesus. He must have an evening of what's going to happen. But to this, to this important moment when he 
saw his risen Lord was completely the lamb to the line of Judah. That's a different picture at all. That's right, and the, and, the, and the kind of fear and terror they uh, many saints experience in that kind of moments doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same kind of terror you would have in other things, but it's more like this deep reverence and honor which just smacks you flat down on the floor. All right. Thank you very much for your attention and if you want to ask something more you can definitely do that. Um, now um, we are planning to do a comp line at the end of this, which So, uh, if you need to go home, uh, you're very much uh, welcome to do so, and there will be uh, no sense of spiritual superiority over you if you do. But uh, if you want, we can just uh, head upstairs, uh, put the candles on, and sing the compline in the chapel. It's, uh, it's a simple and rather quick service. And